Good evening, everyone. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the spring lecture series, uh, alas, uh, launching it online, uh, but with the promise that we'll all be back in person next week. It's with equal pleasure that I welcome Brad Clopeville back to Cooper Union for an option level studio this semester. And this lecture in part will help to advance a broader discussion he's bringing into our school. I wanna thank Nora Akawi for the patience and intellectual insight she's brought to the lecture series at large with many areas of focus, formats and fidelities. We have our ongoing collaborations with the Architectural League. Uh, we invite Cooper Union alumni to, to keep us in touch with their ongoing work. Uh, we have our student lecture series and we have our own visiting critics of which tonight's lecture is a part. And of course, we have the pluriversal, bewildered and otherwise lecture series curated directly by Nora herself. I will relieve you of the usual formalities for the introduction tonight. Uh, Brad Clofield is no stranger to Cooper Union nor to the discipline. Widely published, awarded and exhibited, it is the quality of the work, its speculation and attention to detail that bear the evidence of an intellectual project much larger than, the co than commissions normally allow. Given the formality of his previous lecture here a couple of years ago, the breadth and depth it offered, I've asked Brad to break with normative formats for this evening, perchance not so much going through project by project, but instead to tackle what he deems critical to each project, whether it be in its entirety or a detail. To this end, I'm interested in the choices he's had to make, the predicaments he's had to face, and the dilemmas he's had to overcome. When we see beautiful slides of completed projects, we often forget the debates that lurk behind them. Maybe the result of the aesthetic control the photographs maintain over our concentration. So this is an opportunity to see behind the curtain, under the hood, as it were, to better understand the engines that motivate his thinking and the ethic he brings to critical choices. As Brad and I spoke, uh, uh, after the convocation this year, uh, a week ago, he remarked on the quality of the presentations, the, the depth, uh, the, the variety of the areas of focus, but also the, the degree to which the building uh, as artifact is somehow set in the margins of the broader academic discussion today. For this reason, it is also important here to underscore his commitment to buildings as the site of research, speculation, and debate itself. Brad has built extraordinary buildings, and they amaze at, at many, many levels. While all are somehow indebted to conceptual strategies that might even sometimes remain invisible to the eye, there's little doubt that the experience they unleash demonstrates that architecture operates in the realm of the senses. And yet being a great architect is one thing, but being a great teacher is altogether another. So I'd like to think that build, the buildings of allied work uh, are not good because of their aesthetic precision alone, but rather that they hold something exemplary in the, in the way that they're able to teach us. Each are didactic instruments in themselves and each tells a story particular uh, for the discipline of architecture. Thus, how Brad uh, is able to translate our focus on the architectural object to the realm of experience is what seems to be at stake in his pedagogy. So with these brief uh, observations, uh, let me welcome you again to our spring 2022 20, lecture series, and, and please help me welcome Brad Clopfield to the virtual stage. Brad. Thank you, Nadir. I, it's as always with with you. It's a matter of living up to your to your introductions. So, as as Nadir mentioned, I'll 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 go through this talk really as a conversation and a conversation about about the the tools, uh, the tools and the thinking uh, and the kind of mechanism. I guess uh, the, the spirit of inquiry 
that we we bring to the work. And I, I choose this term calling, and I choose all of the words that I'll use for the headings tonight very carefully. Um, the idea of calling, of, 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 of listening to hear the possibilities and, and presence of architecture is something that means a tremendous amount to me. Um, I use language just like I use visual tools, trying to name what we're finding, what we're searching, what evocations, what possibilities exist in the world. And they're often poetic. They aren't, they aren't really the thing themselves, but they're, they're, they're words that represent a presence of bridging of a lost riverbed, a dry lake bed that the wind only in the muddy season moves the rock across, across that surface. I mean, sites in so many ways are just manifestation of forces. And that act of, of listening to the calling is, is a critical is a critical beginning. I'm always in awe of sites, uh, just the possibilities of place and, and and the kind of the kind of soundings that it puts out and it creates in me, it creates in me literally almost a, a melancholy longing for the potential of the architecture. And it doesn't matter if it's urban or suburban, doesn't matter if it's an abandoned site. If you, if you pause, if you pause and listen, and listen with your eyes and all of your senses, you begin to sense a possibility for an architecture that none of us have ever seen. You know, it's, it's, a, it's the possibility to pursue. It's the, it's the, it's the thing that drives, drives us all forward in the work and in and in my practice over the last 20 years or so you know, we've been blessed with such a diversity of sites um, all of them with their own charge and challenge and, and potential and we'll talk a little bit about that tonight as as uh, Nadera mentioned and to me this act of listening is a visual act i listen with my hands you know, I, I listen with all my senses, but I think, I think as an architect, and I love this quote by Ellsworth Kelly, um, uh, as an architect, I'm trying to find what exists, what that energy and charge, what that potential presence is that only building, only building can manifest. And I believe in building so deeply. I believe in the, the, the potential of building to reveal something in a place or an institution um, that, that we wouldn't see otherwise. And, and that, that uh, mission, that goal to reveal something is, is what we spend our time trying to understand and trying to find. And, and again, these are all sort of what I would consider acts of listening, drawings and models that not, you know, some of them are more representational than others. All of them are intended to just evoke the possibilities in a kind of response. Some using structure, some imagining structure. This was an arts building at the edge of a meadow against the redwoods in California, where just that diaphanous, a thousand foot long piece of structure was, was the site work that we, we begin with. And we often do that, the kind of archetypal act. You know, what, what's the first, act of building, uh oh, and now I froze, which, all right, there we go. What's the first act of building that's the, that represents the, the ultimate presence? Because as, all, as we all know, building buildings is a complicated and drawn out and complex process. So we try to do these pieces uh, that are really idealizations of the architecture. And as we move into conventions of building and practice and economy, we try to hold those, those things dear to the work and revisit them. In St. Louis, the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis, we were given a site in this neighborhood that had been long, long devastated. And, and it was one of the most difficult challenges of how to make a there there, how to establish a ground, how to hold the ground for art, for contemporary art. 
and so we considered this this idea of weaving two layers of concrete structure some that hold the street edge which isn't held as you saw in the photo before that and then some that invites you in and provides a sense of transparency so it's a structurally transparent body with just two simple orders of concrete beams that represents a kind of field of transparency for the art and it creates a site it creates a there where as you saw in the photos didn't exist before the the National Music Center of Canada. Yeah, I don't know why we're always given such beautiful sites. There, maybe that's something I should question in this in this practice. But this was our site, and it spanned both sides of that intersection, left to right, with the cream blue colored building, an existing old blues club that we had to renovate and maintain. So we had to bridge the building and bridge the street and create this context for all things music in Canada. And I'll, I'll get back to it a little bit when I talk about iconography. But just but create a building that wove that site together, preserved that building. And then, like I said, created a, a, created a monument, which represents and elevates the status of, of the musical history and legacy of, of a nation. And then inside those bands of structure, those instruments weave together, and the whole building became an instrument where the performance space leaked out between these vessels and that were weaving this structure and up to the natural light, natural light above. So it began with a system to span and bind the site together that then bound the whole building together and, and literally created a, a building being played by the music. The Met, we, we were in the finals of adding a contemporary wing to the Met a few years back. And it was a, a similar site challenge, but this one, how to invert a building. It was the, 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 the mission was to recreate the contemporary wing and create a new entrance to the Met in the, in the park, in a building that we all know probably couldn't be more, more introverted. Um, and it's a theme that comes up in museums time and time again. So we proposed a new pavilion that was luminous, that filled the park with light, that drew people in, that conceptually uh, bound two things together, natural light from above, and then horizontally the park with the concept model on the left really representing those intersections of three things. Um, the white bands being shafts of light and the park on the right and the building on the left. So how to bind these things together, we came up with a thought where the light and structure fall through the same voids and you follow the light up and you follow the structure up. It's a series of columns, structural fins and transfer beams so that when you come in, you rise up with the structure into the light um, and then arrive in the galleries and then all of the galleries become filled with natural light as they spill through the structure. The structure reflects them into the lower galleries. And then the facade itself uh, was, was a transparent face to the park, but with all of the protections that museums, museums require, it was a series of cast glass, reflective and reflect, uh, refractive uh, panels that allowed you to see in more or less, and then and then keep out the, the the western the western light. So finding the work in those places in a response to the opportunities, finding the work. I mean, the calling also extends to the institution itself. What what can architecture? Offer or elevate in the in the institution that. That, that, that the institution is aspiring to or that the community calls out for. Um, I think we have a tremendous responsibility and also a tremendous tool as architects in that people come to us asking for things and we listen, but we also know because we're experts in the language of building, we know what building can do for them. So, it's a fascinating thing to listen to those requests and, and attempt to understand the potential and then initiate a, a, an architecture that, that elevates those things and amplifies those things. And, and service, the idea of service is another 
and critically important concept to me um, that we build in service of an idea in service of, uh, uh, of an understanding. And again, with a deep understanding of what architecture can and can't do, um, but, but, to, but to, to elevate some quality, some characteristic, to create spaces that inspire. I think really it's as simple, it's as, it's as simple in that. Well, one of our first buildings, the Widening Kennedy headquarters, we created an amphitheater filled with light in the middle of, of the city and in the middle of a block, which became one of the most important civic spaces in Portland used for concerts and all kinds of other activities. The National Music Center, again, you know, creating rooms that people want to use. Contemporary Art Museum, St. Louis, same thing. And then in service of solitude, which really was the, the quest of, of the Clifford Still Museum. You know, it's a, a single purpose museum for an amazing body of work um, with the opportunity for you as an individual to establish a relationship with this, the, the, this powerful, beautiful work. So that building created a sense where these other buildings make grand civic spaces and gesture. This building extends a hand that holds you with that body of work and that art in the most intimate, intimate way possible. And that architecture to me is not the subject. Arch architecture is, is really just the possibility, the possibility and, and the tool and the mechanism to, to really set life in motion. And I, I think it's interesting in that we have to exercise the utmost control to build a building, to get it done, to merit that, that expenditure of money and capital, capital and, and kind of even spiritual effort that a community puts out. And then the building is really just a catalyst to set things in motion. And I think that's what's so exciting for me is to see what the life of the building becomes and what it can generate. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gift of, of what we do. As I mentioned in Wyden and Kennedy, the center space that began as an auditorium and then became a boxing ring and a symphony hall and, and a, a space where Elizabeth Streb dropped from the ceiling and it, it just it became a generative space for an entire community and how to use it and, and what can happen there buildings that 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 become sites themselves I, I love the idea of, of art museums rather than being precious objects are, are things that inspire other acts upon them within them upon them and that and that the the life of a, of a built act com compounds over the years. It's one of the most thrilling things. I, I love the loss of control for me that, you know, and again, as I, as I mentioned, we, we spend years maximizing control and that day when you step back in a way is one of the most thrilling, thrilling parts of the whole, the whole experience. The National Veteran Memo Veterans Memorial, I'll talk a little bit more detail. There was an enormous site, 10 some acres, with a, with a moribund expo center, which they demolished. And I was tasked with a 20,000 square foot, I think it ended up being almost 30 in the end, but 20,000 square foot building. So how to hold that ground? How can a small building that began as a, as a, a, a state memorial actually, and, and then it evolved into a national, national monument, but how can it hold the ground and, and elevate this idea of service and that, the initial act was an earthworks, in my mind, and then lifting the earth, because that's all we had, right, was to sort of use the whole site and lift it up to create a processional ramp and a sanctuary for all the various ceremonies of, of departing to service, coming home from service, memorial services, and then a community space that, that would be inspiring for the community of Columbus to use. And then how to hold the ground with structure. Again, using any language we can find to search for that presence, that, that you know, that, that there'll be something that binds that, that place to the site, that holds and protects the legacy of the veterans, 
um, here porcelain, porcelain uh, weaving porcelain plates, which then resulted in these enormous cantilever arches that are held by a tension ring. And the, and the three layers of structure getting smaller and smaller, smaller in, the, in the middle, creating a processional that leads up to the building and then goes through the building in the, in the gallery spaces. But a, a, a monumental act of earthworks, isn't this crazy how it looks like a model or a rendering, but it's actually a photo. Um, it's always a little unsettling to me. <laughs> Maybe it's the baby trees that get planted in the, be in the beginning. I'm not quite sure about that. But, but um, how, how to hold that ground, how to hold a sacred space for the veterans. That was also one of the things in, in working with Senator John Glenn and, and others on the project, um, thinking about this literal idea of service and how, how people leave their homes and their families to serve our country in various ways. Um, and, the, and a building like this had not been built for the average, for the average uh, service person, the average soldier. So it became a very powerful and, and moving, moving act for me, working with, uh, working with the people in service, working with Senator Glenn, working with the people of Ohio uh, to create this space that elevated that sense of service, created this relationship with those who serve and a place of memory too. I think that's one of the most powerful things. Um, once one creates, or I guess aspires to, to occupying a site in that way, elevating a sense of place and, and purpose, it, it really becomes a destination. You know, it, it has become a pilgrimage of sorts for, for people who served, which was, which was all, all a sense of discovery for me in working, working on the projects. And then this idea of invitation. You know, when, when working in the public realm like we do and, and, and working on so many public institutions, there, there, it always becomes a conversation of, of who, who the building is extending a hand to, you know, what, what form of invitation and, and, and who the building is speaking to. And I think now all of us here over the last five years in particular, that, that question has been elevated more than any time in my life. And it's, it's really exciting to think about the nature of the civic, right? The nature of civic space and what, inspires people to occupy and protest and use space in unexpected ways, in ways they haven't before, and what spaces grant license to that kind of use and to that kind of conversations. You know, when you, when you work, like we do so much in museums, which are buildings that are all about protection and control, um, for, for, for practical reasons as much as anything else, how, how do you how do you make them feel public? How do you make them grant ownership? How do they extend that hand um, to, to people is, is an interesting thing. And, and, and being raised as a contemporary architect, this issue of iconography and communication has become a kind of primary subject of the office. You know, we all, we've all been raised in the Western worlds with, with a history of neoclassical architecture manifesting the kind of romantic ideal of, of institutions. And then, of course, in our lifetimes, um, watching that change radically, but also interesting when you look at these images together, isn't it? What it communicates and, and, and who, who, who we really think, you know, what the symbolic representation is to where's the front door, which some of us have struggled with our whole lives. And then we've seen it usurped, this iconography. And in recent years, as the Trump administration tried to legislate that all future government buildings use neoclassical language. And luckily that was, that was overturned. But, but, that, but that ability to speak and invite and communicate and the mindfulness of, of what that leads to is, is, is critical. 
And for me, so many times, the, the, the search for iconography comes from the landscape. And then how to translate that into, uh, 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 or elevate that into a sense of cultural importance. This is, there's a field of, of uh, geologic forms called the hoodoos in Southern Alberta, which interestingly enough, Clifford Still, when he first learned to paint, he grew up in North Dakota, uh, painted these, which is just a sheer coincidence, but they were the, the kind of primary ins uh, inspiration for, for the National Music Center. In the concept model on the left, the first conception of the building is a series of five-story vertical monuments to music, each with a different function and a different purpose and a different presence. And then as I talked earlier, weaving them together in one structural system that bridges across the road, thinking of that building as an instrument, and, but thinking of it elevating the status of music in a country. And this is project is being presented in honor of Ray Huff, who is here tonight, which I think is quite interesting. You know, this was a small architecture studio building for Clemson that we were asked to do in, in Charleston, North Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina, one of the most beautiful cities in America. And, and a, you know, very fragile environment with an with a incredible architectural history. So finding a language for the building, we looked to garden walls, we looked to, 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 to things that we found in the neighborhoods, developed a, a series of structural walls that wove together and became perforated to control the natural light. And the building became, a, like, I, like I said, a series of screens, structural screens um, that brought light in the building, filtered light through. And then we tried to break up the scale of the building to the neighborhood. It's actually on a busy commercial street. And then ultimately, which is also an interesting part of this conversation, the building was rejected by the community as being too contemporary. Um, we uh, were in the finals for uh, the Holocaust Memorial in, in London a few years ago and working with my wife, Lisa Straussfeld, uh, uh, conceived of a building that was based on both the manuscripts of, of the 210 survivors that, the, that, the, that the, the country had recorded before they died. And that's represented by the concept model. And then also in the form of the tallet, the, the, the prayer shawl, um, we lifted up a section of park that was the site to invite people to, to wander into this shell. Um, and in that shell was an, an ongoing tape of single voices of testimonials of survivors. So in this case, the iconography was metaphorical and, and, and somewhat literal, um, but, 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 but invited, invited the public in, 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 a, in a very civic space, in a very civic way. The Clifford Still Museum relative to invitation is also interesting. This is a terrible slide, I don't know why. But it was an empty site next to the Daniel Liebskin uh, Denver Art Museum, surrounded by you know, architectural monuments that were quite uh, extroverted, you could say. And since this was really about a single person's work and a single voice and quite a small building, the idea of the building pressing into the ground Bringing, bringing you to the ground, bringing natural light to the ground. Uh, I even conceived of burying the, 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 the building in a grove of trees so that you wouldn't see it as an object. You would find it under the canopy of, of trees. And it also goes back to the budget of small trees, but eventually, eventually you will. The outside of the building will be completely obscured by the trees and, and you'll discover it by just seeking the shade of the, of the park and then enter into, enter into the gallery. So really an iconography that is just a presence and related to the canopy itself and extending that, that kind of sanctuary. I mean, in, in many ways, the, the Clifford Still Museum is a, is, a, is a chapel. It's a kind of destination for the self and the individual uh, in the midst of all of this city and all of these major institutions.
Oh, right. And then, and then uh, the U.S. Embassy in, in Mozambique. This was a fascinating, and we're, we're embarked on another one now, but the, the, the idea of a U.S. Embassy is a fascinating one, as you might imagine, and fraught in many ways. But we were hired right when they were changing the program. And, and Maputo is on the edge of the Indian Ocean. And we were given this amazing 10 acre site. Uh, and embassies are primarily office buildings, but they house all the aid agencies as well as the diplomatic corps. Um, and then there's a number of support buildings. But the, the, the goal of this project was to render it. I mean, first of all, the discussion was what does the building want to communicate? And historically, these projects had been very closed compounds with concrete walls for obvious security reasons. But this, this was in the Obama administration. So the idea was to create a transparent building. And we created a transparent building, as you saw with those bars of space that, that split open for views of the ocean. And then in a cross section where even if you're only invited into the lobby because there's four or five different security clearances to move through the building, you can see the entire life of the building. You can see through the entire embassy. So the idea was to see out from the outside in, when you come in to sense the life and the energy of all the people working then and all the programs and to, to basically feel invited, right? That it, that it communicate a sense of invitation to, to the world and connect back to this amazing landscape. And so part of the challenge, and this gets somewhat technical, was to deal, how do you make a transparent building on the Indian Ocean in Mozambique? And so we designed a, a building shell, which initially was structural, which we're now being asked to do again, um, and also uh, light, light shading. And it was a, a series of precast enormous precast panels that were precast in Turkey and brought to the site. Um, and each facade had a different geometry to create very large apertures. These little ziggy zaggy apertures you see are about four by three feet um, that block out all the, all the direct sun. So it was a sun very sophisticated sun shading device all in the goal of rendering a building, you know, a building that represents the United States as transparent, which was at the time we designed it, this is like six, seven years ago, I guess, more than that maybe, um, was really a radical act. And then connect it to this extremely beautiful, beautiful, beautiful site. So that's it. Recently, it somehow now looks like a hotel, you know, in, in Miami Beach, but um, certainly a contrast to, um, to the legacy of building of US embassies that, that are going on to date. And this building just, just, just recently opened. So I'll end and we can have a discussion um, with a few just, just quick hits on recent work. Um, and it's quite, quite varied. And as I mentioned, I think before, the, the, I think the process of listening of deep listening and with an ethic of service, of, of listening to determine what, what the buildings can serve, what the built act can serve. It's, it's, I think it's more important to use that language. What can that act of building serve and what can it set in motion and what, what, can, it, what can it catalyze? Um, and, I, and, I, and we have now a range of projects. This, this, I think, is fascinating. It's a longer story. Tiny little town in, in Oregon, little university town, with a historical society. And I have to tell the story. I, I, the director must have called me 10 times. And I didn't know anything about this historical society. And I just couldn't imagine you know, what we could do for them. Finally get through to her. She knows Ando's work. She knows everyone. It was quite extraordinary. And I just fell in love with her and her vision. And in this little tiny town with a historical society, she raised $6 million in five years and built this, what they now, I think they now call it the Art Museum of, of Corvallis. Um, but it was so, 
for me to work with an individual who had such a selfless philanthropic vision for her community and for what she could offer with this collection and how she could build a collection and just believing in the place and in her and finding a way finding a way to make it make it happen make it happen for them on this on this little main street on this 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 modest it's an agricultural city in kind of uh, the middle of Willamette Valley and then this passion project uh, as I am a, a, an enormous soccer fan and this stadium is two blocks from my Portland office we were asked to well, actually, we weren't asked to. We uh, this has a little bit of a story too. I met with the president of the team after they won a national championship, and I asked him uh, if they were going to leave the city and build a new stadium. You know, like like that happens, right? To get more, to make more money, and to you know spend more money on players. And I'm you know I was a believer, and he said no, we want to stay. And I asked if he had ever seen how many seats he could get in, and he said no. And I I said well, we'd love to. Think about it with you and he looks at me and says you don't do stadiums and i said i know and and uh but three weeks later he called me up to ask me if i was serious and we i said of course and i said give us 60 days and we'll see what we can come up with so we 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 did it pro bono and we came up with this idea that made a vertical tray of seats that you could build during the season without disrupting the existing seats and cantilevering over the top of them um, yeah, and, and just creating this wall of people, which became then, of course, uh, a, a kind of grid of concrete structure that binds it to the site with tension rods that go down to the street for this 150 foot cantilever of woven structure. I mean, it's a pure structural concept of, of truss work and, and concrete base. Um, that really created a transparent facade to this stadium. We, we were able to build over the sidewalk. You're able to see into the stadium from the street. You see all the activity of people moving and then create this wall of, 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 of sound and, and sight and, and vision. And a, as a soccer fan, I couldn't be more thrilled. It's also one of the most difficult buildings I've ever done. Um, but very, very exciting. And then on last, uh, our most current project, which is under construction now, uh, another site response, Penn State University Art Museum at Sana, next to a botanical garden. And the idea of creating a building that meanders and creates its own sub gardens and, and sculpture gardens and just really weaves into, into the site uh, and keeps a low profile and bracketing views and connections and transparencies and, and really becoming a part of, of the garden. And then each one with its own source of light and connection, each one of the pieces of galleries or education spaces doing a kind of sectional weave at the same time. Uh, like I said, this is under construction now. I don't think I have any current sites. But um, it's a very simple building that really, really just attempts to connect to its place. And then, of course, like all of our museums, to fill the galleries with kind of luminous, luminous natural light. So thank you. Turner, thank and, Sabrina. You. Turner and Sabrina specifically, because you're on my screen. <laughs> nice to see you. So Nader. Thank you, Brad. Uh, as expected, uh, a range of just stunningly beautiful work and um, uh, leaves one speechless. Uh, and yet, um, uh, as it turns out, language is very important to you. and. Uh, I am struck by uh, your use of language and, uh, and how it underscores certain priorities. So I think as a start, maybe it would help to just come to terms with the way that you're using 
your four categories. Uh, and I'm charging you with certain things. So uh, you have to, uh, I, I suppose, defend uh, your position in some, in some way or another. But the calling uh, that you refer to is, is characterized by your appeal to listening, something out there. It's about an externality. It's something that does not come with, from within per se. It, it, it actually, it, it, it means that the architect in some way or another has to draw in from something outside of herself, himself, to be able to internalize it in a completely different way that they would have no normally imagined. But in looking at your work, um, and this is a good thing, one realizes that almost invariably there's an agency that you yourself bring to it that has absolutely nothing to do with the site. Uh, hmm. The geometries, the, hmm. the forms of aggregation, the interlocking spaces, uh, these don't just happen. They're not acts of God, uh, yeah. nor are they acts of nature, really. So, um, so I, I think it's generous to say that, um, you know, this is about calling or listening to something out there because it, it suggests uh, that you're taking something from the outside Mm -hmm. uh, but it appears to me that there is also something in your work, uh, and this is true of all categories you you frame, by the way, that is so focused on uh, systems of assembly and discrete ways of iterating something to produce a myriad different circumstances uh, mm -hmm. that that I would charge you with comes not so much with listening to externalities, but they are disciplinary traits that come from within architecture mm -hmm. that are then tested out onto uh, uh, various publics, various sites, various geographies. And I, I wonder if you could help clarify mm -hmm. this question. Mm -hmm. uh, the listening, I, I firmly believe um, that the listening is the first act of architecture. And it, it, it's listening to discern, I mean, we bring the will of the architect. That's, you know, we are, we are it's our metier. <laughs> you know, we, we, we have a hand as architects. It, that's, you know, that goes without saying, I think. Um, but but so I'm I'm sure I have my own language. Structure means a great deal to me. So the first acts are always structural. You know, they're they're, they're to me they're the archetypal act of occupation. So I, I I bring that with me. But the 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 license to to act of of, of in what way to build. Um, for me comes with the listening. I mean, there, there's, yeah. I, I, and I, I'd be the first to admit, you know, it's an ongoing process and, 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 and may, maybe I heard the wrong call. That could be possible too. But, but there's, when, when I'm asked to do a project and walk onto the site, there's, there's just almost a, a longing for, for the place to, to help, help, me, help me know what, you know what architecture can can offer what what it can do right and the so way the, the the romantic way in which you describe this suggests that there's a kind of calling of god of some sort yeah. that that it uh, it unleashes inspiration in you uh, and it 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 doesn't give you sufficient credit for a project an iterative project that you have undertaken painstakingly over and over again. No, that... it, it, it just manifests the act. It's like that first mark on the paint, you know, what, 
I, yeah, I'm sure it is tremendously romantic, and it, it is not it, not in the point of as a calling from God, but just I, I guess it, it it perhaps it is saying that we know the will it takes to build. We know this exercise of will that is architecture. But if you can glimpse by listening, by, by considering it an act of service, if you can glimpse something larger than the building itself to serve, to reveal, it helps guide your hand. You know, it, it helps guide that language and that act. act Fair of enough. I let me ask you this question then. Imagine if you listen and you listen hard <laughs> and what some, and what the calling is out there is something that goes completely against oh. the disciplinary precision and the and the 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 depth of craft that you bring to your projects that that thing that is stubbornly architectural. Right. Uh, you do you continue to listen. Fantastic. No, I, I, I mean, that's, <laughs> no, that's, no, of course you continue to listen, but there's other forces too. This, this, yeah, boy, this, this is a great conversation. Because I don't believe you is what I'm trying to say. I know you. Because you're, it, you're the it, least romantic person in the room. That's, it's that's not that. that I'm not romantic. It is that precisely I, I can't, the, the amount of control that is exercised and the amount of follow through is is not a calling of nature it is a a, a stubborn working uh, of an individual and teams of people right to make something look natural which is absolutely unnatural no it has nothing to do with looking natural it's just what is the force that propels that first mark right what is that mark in, in, in Columbus, it was an idea of earthwork. Right. So that I wanted to create a ground for this idea of memorial for, for these servicemen, servicemen and women. Um, so what, what propels that first mark? That's all. And then we know the Got force. Of will. And the iconography, it has to be, if it's a national veterans memorial, it has to have a monumental presence, right? Out of respect. I mean, so in a way, I, the calling I, is... The calling in your in your in your mind is more related to the first act. It's the yes. it's the inspiration. It is the the gesture, the mark, the 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 thing that right. uh, the 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 kind of the the figure that uh, uh, it, that stays with you. Which you know, in other terms, is called the diagram, the party, or or some gesture it that is. you hold to. Okay, it that's is. a it that's is. a slightly different thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the first mark, but it's also about what the presence is, and and then that calling comes. From, you you know, it's not just from the place. Then in conversations, when 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 Senator Glenn talks teary eyed about the idea of service and sacrifice, uh, it's compelling. That's another form of calling. It it you know it it creates a regard for the vessel itself and what it's holding. And, yeah. you know, who, who, who it's holding this ground for. And I mean, there's various calls. And yes, there's always, I mean, we build for Christ's sakes. I mean, there's no more willful act than building, right? I, th I think it is just a question of pause. That sometimes, you know, sometimes I think more, more often than not in architecture, the will the will of the architect and the will to, to build is the only thing we see. And we see no different deference to place or culture or anything outside of the, the will of the architect. So yeah, I suppose it is romantic, but it's, a, it's an aspiration, that's for sure. Because I think, I, th I think if that act of building resonates with some of these other forces, if it can gather two or three insights, if it can gather a different source of presence than just the building itself. It, it amplifies the building. You know, it amplifies what the building communicates. Um, when you said service, I, uh, I, I, I kept thinking about uh, Harry Cobb. I'm not, I'm not sure if you were mm -hmm. there for his event at, at Cooper a couple of years ago. And, and he spoke about the predicament uh, of 
serving the public, uh, serving the client, uh, while maintaining a fidelity to the discipline and, and, and how invariably these things sometimes come into a head on collision and that there is some, uh, you know, satisfaction in his mind about the ability to reconcile what uh, often seem as contradictions. But mm -hmm. in your first passage, when you describe service, ironically, I heard you say that, you know, uh, instead of uh, service as a duty to the public, that this is about a service to an idea, which I love very much because it, it suggests that ideas are so important to hold on to uh, because there are ideas and then there are architectural ideas and that when, when the public somehow becomes infused with an architectural idea, it, it, it has the capacity to change them purportedly. But I, I, I wonder, do you see the tension and the contradiction between your service to the discipline uh, versus, uh, again, you know, those things that a uh, community, a, a public, a uh, that duty, whether it's code or or, or, or setbacks of urbanism, uh, those, those all have are, to do it. Yeah, but those things are easy, and function right. is easy. You know, I mean, if, if you have a, a, a any kind of pragmatic sense, those things are they're easy to solve, and they're just they're just problems. But I think the sense of service that I was alluding to and aspiring to. Is when is is when someone comes to you with a project, and they describe it, and they describe a you know series of needs and, and, and desires, and and those are important, right? They're they they are important, but they're but they're the sort of language of lay people, and so I consider it our job and my job is when they describe this thing with whatever language they have right and however informed or not informed it's our job to listen to what to listen for for that need or that need to service that the that a building can actually do above and beyond those things right it's right we know the power of architecture we know the language of architecture we know what architecture can serve right and so if an institution has has an as, aspiration to to connect to the community. If it has an aspiration to just inspire artists, you know, if it, whatever. I mean, you you try to you try to hear the really the bigger question. What's the real question they're asking? Right? Yes, they need you know bigger galleries and they need a larger 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 auditorium and you know more program space and all those things that are absolutely important. But we know architecture can do more that, than that. So what, you know, we try to work with them and think and study the community and study the place to really fully utilize the power of architecture in this idea of service, right? I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and and talk about the the relationship to of practice to pedagogy uh while i do that uh, uh i'm going to invite people to uh write questions in the chat room if they wish and and happy to to engage those also but i you know i'm, I'm struck by uh the amount there is to learn by looking at each of your buildings, each of your projects, uh, the ones you won and the ones you lost, uh, all of them give something and, and um, no two are the same. Uh, you appeal to different uh, iconographies, uh, materialities, spatial orders, uh, and, and it shows a kind of latitude uh, and generosity that uh, you, you demonstrate towards your engagement with different cultures and different ways of working, as it were. Um, but doing something is one thing and teaching it is another. So hmm. Hmm. what is 
what are the differences, if there are any, between the environments of an office and the environment of school? And what, what is the difference between teaching something uh, rather than setting the stage for learning something? Oh, it's, it's huge, isn't it? I mean, we, we've all had gifted teachers. And that, that is a, you know, that is a discipline. That is a, that is a gift. It's a skill. It's a gift. Uh, and, 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 and that skill to, to be able to inspire students to think, to bring a body of knowledge to light, to, to, to share the tools. I mean, only gifted teachers can do that. Um, and Cooper has a few, by the way. <laughs> it's it's quite it's quite inspiring, um, and so for me, yeah, it, there is a difference. I mean, I that's why I I just all I have because I make things, and to to your point, buildings are my research. All I can do is share the buildings themselves. I mean, these are conversations we have in the office. This is not just a presentation conversation. We have these conversations when we're doing those concept models and sketches, and we're trying to to understand what to do. You know how we can serve this project and how we can elevate things and resonate with the place. And so, yeah, I, I feel humbled. Like you know, the convocation, the the amount of research and scholarship is just astounding. Um, and the and the role of the of a school to just inspire and structure thinking and questioning, um, I mean it, it is it, it is amazing and that's is the role of a school. And just to I think that's what you've done such a nice job and it's not common frankly. Of then also bringing people who also think and make into the conversation, you know, and we all aspire to that. I mean, you know, all architects do, right? But I've spent, I've spent my life making these built acts. And uh, so they're, they're my, you know, that's my research vessel. That's, that's, that's all I can, all I can share, you know, and, and to, but to how do you, I'm asking you, how do you teach something when you don't want them to do what you do, but you want <laughs> them to do something that they do only? I mean, I, this is a predicament, right? I mean, is, is it that, you, you know, you, you're trying not to produce a, a master uh, model of studio where they end yeah. up simply yeah. emulating what you do, but rather you set up a framework for something completely other that you cannot control. So what, how do you do that? I, I the, the way I do it, I guess, is to help, help them or introduce the idea of, of a discipline of questioning the possibilities of architecture, beginning with place, because that's what I know. Right? Um, but, 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 but crafting that conversation of questioning but with the language, we were just talking about it today in studio, that those first thoughts have to portend building, a built act. It doesn't have to be a building even, but, but those sketches that you make in response to a place and the possibility of a program, right? And whatever you're inspired to do, they have to carry the charge of the built act. And that I can help because I know what that is. I know how to make those marks that that become a concrete wall or a transparent frame or a, you know, I think that bridge, that bridge of just that element, you know, my my I think my work is fairly archetypal that way, it begins with those acts and kind of ends with those acts. Once the structure is done, the building's kind of done. So I think I can I can offer that discipline. There is a that is a specific discipline. That's the discipline of an architect. Is that in the end we build, right? And if, and if it's an idea that it's not does doesn't result in a built act, then it's you know it's not architecture. It's research. It's thesis, which is all super exciting, right? But I want people to build amazing buildings. 
I want my world to be filled <laughs> with amazing buildings, <laughs> right? I, I want to see things that that you know that I I'm in awe of and that are inspiring, and I want I want people to build, be you know, because our world is so banal. It's so filled with banality and. You so say hard. that in the last, just in our generation, in the last 30 years, uh, with uh, the explosion of the internet, with communication that is global, uh, hasn't architecture uh, exploded in a way that it yeah. probably never did when we were in school? I think so. No, I think so. There's so much good work now. It is true. There is. There is so much good work now. It's so inspiring. And what happens when, because it, there's a lot of good work, there's also a lot of spectacle. And you, you, you <laughs> say you want to be surrounded by amazing work. All of them out there are trying to do amazing work. So okay. what draws the line between that which is spectacular and that which is amazing? I, I'm asking you to be critical here. Yeah, yeah. I go back to listening. When it's strictly the will of the architect, right? When it becomes an act of will and ego and image, and they don't all go together necessarily, but more often than not, they do. And also when they're, when they're strictly acting in service of the, the market of architecture, how to distinguish yourself in the market of architecture, right? Rather than serving something else. Right, we, we, you know, I mean, you could say nobody had a bigger ego than Le Corbusier and yet go to Ronchamp and there's some other forces at work there than just the will of the architect. Am I not right? I, I, I would agree. I, I happen to like Firmini better, but anyway, that's <laughs> All right. choosing between chapels. <laughs> but I, I think, there has to be a will to connect with something beyond just, just the object. Yeah. And there has to be a will. If there's not a will, it's just an object and it can be a beautiful object, right? But, but for it to, to really resonate in ways, I think the buildings we all go back to, we return to, we're moved by lay people, architects, everything, are, are buildings that connect, connect parts of our lives and psyche and spirit that wouldn't be connected otherwise. Um, I would be lying if I said uh, that I'm not uh, moved by uh, the images that you've shown and, and the buildings that I've seen uh, of yours. Uh, and I had imagined in the beginning that when you talk about listening uh, to a calling, that there's another aspect to all of this, which all architects, everybody in the audience can relate to this, is that almost every architectural act involves uh, you know, one translation, because the people that ask you to do, do buildings are tran translating a desire, but into something, you have to translate their desires into something architectural, into something formal, spatial, material. Uh, and that requires a form of empathy mm -hmm. uh, and social engagement uh, mm -hmm. that in some ways has in the first instance has nothing to do with form. It really has to do with a cultural empathy. And right. only in the second instance uh, does it require architecture, which is where you bring your skill to it. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the listening process that you talk about, what is it that you do that uh, internalizes uh, the differences in people uh, uh, that you come across, you've now built in different continents and in different socioeconomic uh, climates uh, with levels of civicness and security and control mm -hmm. uh, uh, unleashing themselves onto your buildings. Uh, and so how do you, what is the process of engagement that you undertake mm -hmm. uh, that uh, allows that empathy to to, to draw from these differences out there? What do you do? What, what, is the, what does the design process entail in your case? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really hard question. That's a really hard question. I mean, I, I, I think 
it, it comes down to discernment, right? What, what, how, you know, back to the iconography question, what, it, what is, what is the building trying to elevate for them? Is it, is it, is it just purely a community act? Is it, is it a, is it, is it a, iconic cultural symbol to the community? Is it strictly a transparent invitation? Is it an open platform like St. Louis, an open platform for artists to install work, to inspire people to make work? Yeah, what, what, is, what is the larger, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the same language, you know, what is the larger calling of the place, right? Right, I, th I think trying to discern those things I mean, in all of this conversation, as a, as a form of criticism, right? I mean, there are all these concentrations of wealth and, the, and these acts of philanthropy, you know, kind of gifted, if you will, to a community, right? All right, so they, they come with a certain exclusiveness. And, and so how does one, it's it's so interesting. How does one honor that act of of philanthropy? How does one? I mean, there's a responsibility. I mean, I think this is coded in some of your questions too. There's a responsibility that if someone gives you 120 million dollars, that you make something that's significant, that that stands, you know, the force of time, that that represents the the elevation of a, a cultural moment at that point in history and that even is beautiful so there is a subtext to all of this i mean it's it's an interesting you know it, it'll be an interesting next few years in in this conversation of culture and concentrated culture i mean there's a i think there's a there's forces afoot to to disperse these concentrated acts of culture right and and probably rightly so right and it'll you know it'll be interesting i think in the in the next few years and certainly in the next 20 years to see to see where the course of these conversations of culture go let and me that, let me read given your responses give me let me read what randy uh craig is asking he's saying uh, given the many social, cultural, racial reckonings, yeah. uh, have you changed the who of who you are listening to? Yeah, we we have and we are, and it. But it's also you are the bridge to the philanthropic forces initiating these projects. So there's the programs of the cultural institution. There's the will of a cultural institution. And then it's the fact that it is a cultural institution, right? That it's a manifestation. It's really, you know, they're, they're still a, a part of a conversation of historical artifact of these concentrations of things. But it, it's, it's an interesting conversation. And Randy's, Randy's exactly right. And I think we'll see the future. These things, these things will evolve. These things will evolve a, a great deal, but but yeah uh, yeah it's interesting. It's a it's a it's a for me to talk more as a self defeating proposition here. I think in my in my lifetime in my practice it'll be for the next generation. Uh, Marin Stang saves some of the conversation. She says, from a cultural criticism history perspective. Uh, you make perfect sense. Uh, romanticism is not an indulgence of impulse, but rather an elaborated discipline uh, of the will, of the acknowledged will. Um, Thank you so uh, much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but but I think the who the who we're speaking to is evolving. It's a subject. It has never been a subject. The first you know, 10 years of my career, 15 years of my career, and it is, it is definitely a subject. But it's also, it's a distinction, and this has become, this was apparent to me very early on, even before a lot of the current cultural discourse, is that architecture is just the vessel. 
Yes, it has a, an, an icon, iconographic message, right? But it's the vessel and it's, it's the program, it's the will of the programming is a huge part of this conversation. Huge, huge, huge. What happens there? You know, what happens there? But, but I, 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 I do believe, I still believe in the power of architecture just to inspire. And I, I don't think, I think inspiring space can be universal. It can be, you know, there are places that can be intimidating and exclusive that, that have that sense of monumentality and presence. But I, you know, I know that landscape inspires in a universal way, right? Landscape inspires people, no matter what background, what, what demographic. And I think architecture has the same ability. I, I think it can be as universal and that those, those places of power and, and beauty and inspiration, people want to be there. People, people will come. This but sense of universality that you speak to uh, reminds me of a conversation we were having yesterday in Philadelphia. And I, it's a question I ask many people and I will ask it of you also. Um, Often we feel the pressure uh, as architects to respond to the moment. Uh, and the moment is described by, uh, you know, the social political moment that we're undergoing now or the simply the program that's been delivered to us. But we also know that some of the greatest works of architecture uh, survive uh, the change of programs, the change of politics and, and just, you know, they're fundamentally have to do with something else that have nothing to do with the, the reason why they were conceived in the first place. Mm -hmm. If I were to ask you, uh, beyond the public that you're serving here and now, who are you talking to of a different time and of a different era? I mean, I'm interested in the conversations that you're having with architects that are centuries dead or discourses that are completely anomalous for our times, but are very relevant to you. Um, for me, the anachronism that is built into work that survives its time mm -hmm. is built into this idea that you're building conversations, if not universal, at least that they're indifferent to some degree to the moment so that they may survive us when we're long gone and that they're speaking to histories that have long passed us. Mm -hmm. So to whom are you speaking? Well, it's, I talk about it. Um, we were just talking about this today in studio. And this, this is my choice of language. Will, will, will get me in trouble in this conversation. But um, I think beautiful rooms are the rooms that people come back to and reinterpret. You know, palazzos that were, you know, the elite of, or the hotels that were the elite of Paris that then became, you know, office buildings that then, then became hospitals during the war, which then became hotels again, but for the public, which then became museums. I mean, and all with that iconography of, of, of the, exclu the exclusivity of, of, the, of, the, of the, the wealth of, of, of France, right? So I think buildings that, that have a charge, yeah, buildings that are beautiful to occupy and have, you know, that, that elevate your spirit in some way will, will be reused. It's, and it's challenging, you know, National Veterans Memorial is much more a monument than it is a room, right? So how would that building be repurposed? But yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's a harder question, yeah. Yeah, some some of it's some of it's harder when they become such figural monuments to, and and so distinct in that way. But one one would hope that the that there's some archetypal nature to the space that resonates. I mean, we all know those spaces that we think do now, right? I mean, we return again and again to those kind of places. Um, so so one would hope, and I think. In, so, in some way, my, my belief in structure, and again, it reveals my romantic nature, 
you know, this idea of building beautiful ruins, you know, that the first act of building is the last act of building and, and, the, and that that carries forward, I think, some form of presence that, that will at least stand over a period of time and, and, and give it the opportunity to be reinterpreted and evolves. But, but yeah, I, I would say it's my belief in structure. Structure. Well, that my question is more reductive than the way you're trying to answer it. I, I'm curious about actual individuals and protagonists that you love and, and you hate. You know, like <laughs> people that you think are irrelevant, people, great people, let's say great architects who are irrelevant, but really, let's say marginal architects that you think should have been looked at and inspected much more closely because of the way that you bring a different reading to them. It's this, that's the nature of my question is this, how do you build discourse internally because of the obsessions that you have? How do you curate discussions in your mind based on people that are no longer here, but are very much part of the history of architecture or a history that was never given primacy? I guess, I guess, uh... This is an evasive response. I know that be, I know my educational legacy is so clear, and the and the lineage of my professors back to Khan and and the conversation that I'm a part of just be, as a result of the education I've had. I just focus on the work, you know, what I can offer. I, I really do. And when I encounter buildings that that are beautiful and inspiring, nothing makes me happier. But that kind of discourse, I let that go. I, I really, it's like, it, it, there's sort of too much capital, for, emotional capital for me. I, I care too much to be in that conversation. It, it's, it's debilitating. So I just sort of mind my work in that way and hope hope to gain inspiration from work I've seen in the past and and even more, just look for beautiful work, in, in, you know, now, just to, to sort of believe in what we're doing, to see, you know, other people making amazing projects is the most inspiring thing. Let me uh, borrow from Kath Swan's question uh, and ask you, given the amount of public institutional and civic work that you've done, uh, what are the differences uh, in attitude that you bring to residential projects and how uh, is there a different way of working oh. as you go from the domestic to the public domain is there ever is there ever um we always struggle with scale you know using structure as a kind of first act of making and the first site work of a of a place it's 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 hard to find then the, the the place where I can sit with my martini on the on the porch chair. You know, it's to go from a from a from a large scale sense of landscape to the kind of intimacy of dwelling is really 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 challenging. And I and I do think they're just different disciplines. I mean, it's it's no different than doing interiors. You know, doing the restaurant for 11 Madison was one of the hardest things I've ever done. And designing plates and furniture, it's such a different discipline than, than buildings and civic buildings. So it, it's hard to shift like that. I think our little guest house in Dutchess County may be the most successful, successful thing. It's just a kind of little structural habitation, but it's, it's, it's challenging. Yeah. Very hard for me, actually. I love it, but it's very hard. What do you think is the largest problem we have with the academy today? And how would you change the way that we run our schools? I'm asking this as I'm on my way out because- Yeah, it it's a setup. It, 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 it inspires a, a different structural uh, layout for what we do in school, why we do it in this way, right? and how we should do it differently. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll venture a, th a thought. And he, he, here's, 
I, you know, the amount of research going on in architecture today is, is staggering. And, and I think it's, I mean, there's so many opportunities for new technologies and, and new ways of conceiving of making. And, and then I think just new models of thinking based, based on, on, on current aspects of contemporary culture. I think that's all fascinating. I think what's, I think studio culture that focuses on making is, is being lost in many, 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 many schools. I mean, I, I return to, to art education. Art schools, you know, you learn to paint and you're taught by painters and you make paintings, you know, and intermedia work, you work with all kinds of artists working on digital platforms and, but they're all making. You know, I, I, I do think there's, there's evolved in the academy a, a real schism where theory and reach, research has taken over studio culture rather than be amazing theory and research courses. And that, 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 that discipline of, of application of theory and research and thinking to making, I, I think there's a schism. And I, I only, I really, I, I only, I'm in awe of, of all of the ideas and that the students are able to incorporate it and synthesize it. But I really believe there's a discipline that's not being discussed and taught enough of that translation to making. It's a discipline. That's why they're still teaching painting. That's why they're still teaching printmaking. These are things, you know, these are, these are real things. And so I, I, that model of art school is worth worth you know the architecture academies might think think about that and i know we we have this banality it's our it's our own problem you know most of the world of architecture is so profane <laughs> right that there is a desire to distance yourself from from much of it because it is it's kind of just strictly commercial and profane but but it's sad because it we need, again, I go back to the kind of longing for beautiful things, for profound, even simply thoughtful, you know, infill buildings, just, just, just really disciplined acts of architecture making our city streets. I mean, even that skill set is being lost. Yeah, I, I think we're losing, we're losing ground. We are definitely losing ground. And it's a lot of forces, it's not just the academy. But there's a lot of forces working on that. But, uh, but I think a reminder of it is a, is a real studio art. And I think the students are just dying for it. I think, I think it's what they want to. I think they're inspired by all the research, but, but they want to make things. That's why they go to architecture school. So. Brad, uh, you've been incredibly uh, generous with your, your talk and and your responses. Uh, and I think that that response is a, a perfect place to, to bring closure to this discussion. If there are no other questions from the public, uh, I just want to thank you again for uh, joining us this semester and certainly for sharing the work tonight. Thank you, thank you so great, much. Great, great conversation. I'm, I'm happy to be back at Cooper too. It's a treat. Cheers. Cheers. Have a good night, everyone. Night.